Amen. Thanks for taking a, a moment. Well, we are continuing in our series, We Are New Hope. And one thing that we are is we are spirit-filled. We are spirit-filled. In case you didn't know, New Hope is a Pentecostal church. Uh, Pentecostal church, and uh, we're a part of the Assemblies of God. The Assemblies of God is technically not a denomination. It's a cooperative fellowship, meaning there's a whole bunch of churches that say, we agree with this doctrine, and we are going to cooperate together and fellowship together with the main purpose of sending out missionaries all around the world and, and spreading the gospel all around the world. That's why missions is such a big deal here at New Hope. Uh, and we believe, uh, being a Pentecostal church, church, that the Holy Spirit is active today just as he was in the first century church. Um, in 1 Corinthians, there are, are, are nine spiritual gifts mentioned, and we believe that those spiritual gifts are still in function and still in action today as it was in the early church. We believe that uh, spiritual language and the baptism of the Holy Spirit and speaking in tongues is, is something for today, and it's both uh, for privately and private language, but also publicly. We believe in the supernatural. We believe in, in different things, and that's what makes us Pentecostal. Now, sometimes the word Pentecostal is misunderstood or seen as scary, so I just want to try this with you guys. You guys will be my uh, test here, so. Pentecostal. Okay, I didn't see anybody I get too scared there and stuff, but Pentecost literally means 50th. 50th day, that's, that's all it means. So after Jesus' death, his burial, and his resurrection, he instructs his disciples to go into Jerusalem and then wait for the gift that the Father had promised. He instructs them to go and wait until the Father sends them the Holy Spirit. So 50 days after Passover, there was a Jewish festival called Shavuot. In the Old Testament, it's referred to as the festival of weeks or the festival of harvest. Its primary purpose was to thank God for the blessing of the harvest. And in Acts chapter 2, it says that on the day of Pentecost, meaning 50 days after Passover, that the Holy Spirit came to those who were gathered just as Jesus had instructed them to do. And it describes this event where a violent rushing wind came in and filled the room where they were gathered. And there were tongues of fire that rested on top of their heads. And they all began to speak in a different language that were not their native tongues. And other people heard them and said, are these people drinking? Aren't they Galileans? Like, what's going on here? And it's this crazy event that happens in Scripture but that's why those who believe in the active ministry and the active gifts of the Holy Spirit are called Pentecostal. The other night I was laying Sam down for bed, and I always pray with our kids, we sing a song and stuff, and um, I pray first, and then Sam begins to pray, and he says, and God, would you just fill me with your Holy Spirit? And then he pauses, and he goes, but don't put the fire on top of my head because that would really make me afraid, you know. And, 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 that, and I, 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 uh, I explained to him that that was a one-time event to help the people know that Holy Spirit had come. Imagine if I said, hey, uh, Bob, I want you to go down to the airport and I want you to pick up Kevin and wait for Kevin. Wait until Kevin gets at the airport. You're gonna be like, who's Kevin. What's he look like? Is he tall? Is he short? Is he thin? Is he fat? Is he white? Is he black? Where's Kevin? I, I don't know who Kevin is. And so in the Old Testament, there were different symbols that represented the Spirit of God. Oil, um, but a couple of those are fire and wind. And so here these people are, the disciples of Jesus, waiting for someone, for something that they have no idea who that is. They have no idea what this is going to look like. And so what does God do? He sends in these symbols to say, hey, this supernatural experience that you guys are experiencing right now, this is the Holy Spirit. Because they would say, ah, this is the Spirit of God because there's fire. Ah, I remember wind represents the Spirit of God. Ah, and so this is a one-time event. Now, I understand this morning that I'm speaking to a very wide um, range of beliefs and backgrounds about Holy Spirit. There are people who are like myself, who speak in tongues, who believe in the active gifts of the Holy Spirit, and there are people um, who, who have been taught differently. 
that maybe you've had a, a negative experience at a Pentecostal service that really turned you off uh, to just the idea of um, the Holy Spirit and, and what he has to offer. I know that there's just been a lot of different teachings and opinions, and um, I, I, I just want everyone to please hear me this morning. I still want you to attend New Hope, whether you agree with me or not. I, I'm gonna love you the same. I'm gonna treat you the same. But I'm, I, I wanna ask a, a favor this morning that for about the next 20 minutes, as I teach and I show in scripture who Holy Spirit is and why we should be open to, to being filled with the Spirit and living Spirit-filled, I just ask for that next 20 or so minutes that you set aside what you've been taught, your past experiences, your preconceived ideas, all of these different um, things, and you just set those aside and just allow us to look at scripture together and, and then just go from there. Is that, is that fair just to say, like, we're just going to look at the Word of God and we're going to go. My goal this morning is not to manipulate people. My goal this morning is not to form people into a certain shape and this is what you should look like at church and you should raise your hand or you shouldn't raise your hand. That's not my goal because people are different. And, and the Holy Spirit works through people differently and expresses people express themselves differently than uh, each other. Like Pastor Jeff and my dad are very different people. You know, Pastor Brian and myself, we're very different people. One's good looking and one's not. I'll let you be the judge, but we're different people, okay? So this sermon isn't, hear me church, this is not about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. This is about being a spirit-filled Believer, And the goal is to show you who Holy Spirit is. So let me just pray real quick. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word that leads us to truth, God. I thank you for your spirit that's alive. I pray that you would speak through me exactly what needs to be said. And uh, I just pray that our minds and our hearts would be open as we study your word and we do our best to live according to it. I just pray that you would help me communicate into this service specifically what's meant for here and online. And I would just ask these things in your faithful name. Amen. Amen. So if you're taking notes, and I would encourage you to take notes, because this is going to be a little bit of a teaching, um, but the first thing I want you to remember is that Holy Spirit is a person. Holy Spirit is a person. 2 Corinthians 3.17 says, now the Lord is the Spirit. The Lord is is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord, there is freedom. Jesus instructs his followers in Matthew 28, verses 19 and 20, the Great Commission, and he says this, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of who? God the Father, Jesus the Son, and Holy Spirit, the person Holy Spirit. In Acts chapter five, verse three, it shows us that we can lie to the person Holy Spirit. It says this, but Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back some of the price of the land. You can lie to the Holy Spirit. In the Greek, the word spirit is pneuma, and pneuma takes on the neuter, um, uh, the, excuse me, the, the pneuma is neuter, but every time that spirit is used in the verses, there are masculine pronouns that describe pneuma, that describe the Spirit, which makes it hard to disagree that Holy Spirit is a person. Now, I don't have time to pack, unpack this morning the triune nature of God. I don't have time to talk about the Trinity. The Trinity is not a word found in the Bible, but it's just something that helps us understand who God is. But I will just remind you, and it's important to know, that Holy Spirit is the third person of God. I've had it explained to me this way. I've tried to explain it to my kids this way, and it seems to help. It might help some. It's not a perfect analogy, but I am Austin Weaver, and, and, and everything that I do makes up who Austin Weaver is, but I am a father. I've got, I am a son, and I'm also a husband, and I have three distinct roles in each of those responsibilities, but it all makes up who Austin Weaver is. And when I am in a, a father role and I'm fathering my, my children, that doesn't make me stop being a son. And when I'm being a husband to my wife, that doesn't make me stop being a father. It's all the same person. And I know it's difficult to understand. I don't fully understand it. I understand it, but I don't fully understand it. 
that God is three persons in one and Holy Spirit is a person. Continuing to look at scripture, we see different attributes of Holy Spirit. Take notes, okay? The first attribute is that he is a gift. He's a gift. Acts chapter one, verses four and five. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, this is Jesus, while Jesus was eating with them, he gave this command, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Luke 11, verses 11 and 13. Which of your fathers, Jesus is speaking in parables here, which of your fathers, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, though you're evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Jesus describes Holy Spirit as being a gift. You'd be like, well, Austin, you just said that he's a person. How is he also a gift? Well, I view my wife, I view my children, I view my parents, I view many relationships as gifts from God. Now, sometimes the Lord brings gifts into my life where I'm like, God, is there an exchange policy on this gift, you know? Like, is there Amazon Prime, you know, to ship that one back, like, Lord? Um, But there is no other gifts that I value more than the gift of salvation that's free, that can't be earned. It's not by works, lest any man boast. There's no gift that I value more than salvation and the gift of Holy Spirit. And you'll begin to see why as we continue to unpack who Holy Spirit is and how he helps us. And notice, the fact that he's a gift means that we can't earn it, we don't deserve it. All that we have to do is simply ask, and he'll give it to us, his Holy Spirit. So he's a gift, but he's also a helper. John 14, 26 says, but the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I said to you. John 16, 7 says, but I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. Can you imagine you're walking with Jesus and you've seen him do all these miracles and you know at this point like they've professed him as Lord, they've professed him as the Messiah. And he's saying, oh, it's gonna be good that I go away. And you're like, what? Like, good that I go away? What you talking about, Willis? You know, like, I'll be like, that is not good that you're going away. I want you by my side, Jesus. And he's saying, no, 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 no. The helper is coming. Some of your Bibles might say advocate. Did anybody's scriptures say the advocate will come? What is an advocate? An advocate is someone that will come alongside you and that that will help you, that's in your corner, that's gonna support you, that's gonna fight for you. Helper, advocate, it's the same thing. How, How many this morning would say, man, I could really use Holy Spirit to be helper in my life. I've got some stuff going on. I've got some wisdom I need. I need someone to come and come alongside me and be my advocate. How does Holy Spirit help us? Well, there's three ways that I'm just gonna briefly unpack. First is that he teaches us. John 14, 26, we read this, but the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I said to you. Holy Spirit, he teaches us. One thing I'm super thankful about my dad is that he's always teaching me. He's always trying to impart his life experiences, his wisdom, his knowledge, and he's constantly pouring into me to make me a better husband, to make me a better dad, to make me a better pastor or person, and he's just constantly pouring into me. But I'm more thankful that there is Holy Spirit who has infinite wisdom, infinite knowledge, knows everything that he needs to to speak directly into my life to make me the best person that he has called me to be. And not just so that I can say, oh, I'm a good person, but so that I can impact the world for his glory and his kingdom and say, this isn't me. This is the Holy Spirit at work through me in my life to give glory to Jesus and God the Father. I'm so thankful that Holy Spirit teaches us, but also, if you didn't know this, it's the Holy Spirit that brings the Word of God alive when you read the Word of God. That's why it's living and it's active. You see in the back half of this verse, it it says, um, and bring to your remembrance all that I said to you. 
Have you ever had that moment where it's just like, ooh, I remember that verse, and that's gonna help me get through this situation? Be slow to speak, slow to anger, right? Quick to forgive. Man, the Holy Spirit just makes things come alive, and he, he reminds us the word of God, not just the, the, the written word of God. Who was the word of God? Jesus. Why, why do we call Jesus the word of God? Because while he was on earth, he perfectly walked and demonstrated what it is to live the life that God is calling us to live. That is why he's the word. It's like, this is the Bible, this is how it says we live our lives, this is how it's done through the person of Jesus Christ. The word in flesh, the word in the person of Jesus Christ, and Holy Spirit reminds us all of the things that Jesus has taught us as we see through his life and through the word of God. I'm thankful that Holy Spirit teaches us, but he also guides us into truth. Um, Don't throw this scripture up. I accidentally wrote the reference down, but it's John 16, 13. 16, 13. But when he, the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth, and he will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears, and he will tell you what is yet to come. In a world with so much deception, so much fake news, how many know it's important to have someone to come alongside us and lead us into all truth? Can I just encourage you that as you listen to other sermons, as you listen to podcasts, as you read your Christian literature, and even devotions, to take it before the person of Holy Spirit and test it and say, Holy Spirit, is this true or is this just really well-crafted together words that sound true? Because in the last days, there will be many voices. There will be many false prophets. Some of you guys need to turn off the television, the Christian television, and get off some of those prophecies and, and different things and just say, you know what, is this person just casting fear? Is this person just doing this? Or, or is this really aligned with the word of God? And Holy Spirit will help you be able to decipher and say, this is from God and this isn't from God. I just got a text earlier this morning that says, my son saw this and he thinks it's real. And I'm thinking, oh my goodness, we need to align our truth and our lens through the word of God, through the quickening of the Holy Spirit, so that when a TikTok comes up or a YouTube video comes up saying this or 88 reasons why Jesus is coming back in 1988, we can know that it's true or it's not true. The Spirit of God brings truth. Let us not be like moved, you know, just with every wind, with every opinion. Let us be anchored in the Word of God and let it be the Spirit that guides us into truth. Third way that he helps us is he intercedes for us. Romans 8, chapter chapter 8, verses 26 and 27. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. Have you ever been in a situation where you just, you just don't have the words. Like, I feel like as a pastor, I'm constantly in that situation. Someone comes to me and their parent dies. Well, I haven't lost a parent. I, I don't know what to say in that time. You know, they come to me and their kid has committed suicide or there's death or there's disease or sickness or a baby has cancer. I'm just like, I, I don't have wisdom. I, don't, I haven't walked this road before. All I can do is trust in the helper, hello. All I can do is help trust in the helper that comes alongside me and knows the perfect will of God and intercedes on my behalf. That's why I feel personally, it's so important to be open to being spirit filled in the evidence of being baptized in the Holy Spirit so that the spirit can flow through us and pray according to the will of the Father. It's a beautiful thing. Sometimes it's intimidating. Sometimes people have put unfair expectations. Sometimes it's a little bit uncomfortable if you're not raised around that or you haven't been taught on that. But doesn't that sound good that you have the third person of God that knows exactly the will of God that can come alongside you and help you pray when you don't know what to pray? 
I've shared this story before, but I feel led to, to pray it again. I remember when Elizabeth was pregnant with our first kid, Sam. He's seven. He's about ready to go in second grade. And we were over at uh, an event in the, the gymnasium at our student campus. And it was Savannah's Hope, which is a wonderful ministry. And um, she's in the gym. She's probably, oh, probably six months pregnant or so. She's showing. And uh, she just like passed out kind of hits her head on the cement wall of the gym and just falls to the ground. And I just kind of rushed over to her and I didn't, I didn't know what was going on. I didn't know like what was happening. I, and just instinctively, the first thing I started to do is just to pray in the spirit. Because I, I had, I didn't know. I'm like, other people are calling 911, whatever, you know, like I, I just, I didn't know in that moment. But my heart was just like hurting for my wife and my potential child, you know, and, and I, I didn't know, and the ambulance comes, they check her out, and they're like, oh, we don't know what's, what, what happened. Like, do you want to go downtown to get further tests? And we're like, how much would that cost? We're like, 10000 We're like, no, we'll pass. I think we'll trust in the Lord in this one, you know. <laughs> but I'm thankful that in that moment, when I don't know, the Spirit of God intercedes on my behalf. So he is a gift. He helps us, but he also convicts us. We read in John chapter 16, 7, how Jesus would send the helper. But in verse 8, Jesus continues and he says this, and he, and when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. Something that I've learned to love over the years is the conviction that comes from Holy Spirit. I'm reminded of the psalmist in, in uh, David as he writes Psalm 23. You know, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For what comfort me? Thy rod and thy staff. Do you think that a shepherd is just taking that rod and just massaging his sheep? You know, you think he's just using that as like, oh, come on, get a good stretch here, Billy Sheep, you know, whatever it is. No, you know what the rod and the staff is for? Is to keep the sheep within the parameters of safety that leads them beside still waters and leads them to green pastures where they can rest. It's thy rod and thy staff. And I have learned that there is comfort when the Spirit of God begins to convict me and says, hey, Austin, we probably shouldn't be saying that. Hey, Austin, we probably shouldn't be thinking that. Hey, Austin, we shouldn't be doing that. There's comfort in that. One of the things, and this might not be you, but one of the things that I value most in relationships is when people love me enough to tell me when I'm being a knucklehead. <laughs> to, they love me enough to say like, hey, you were wrong in, in this situation, you know? But, but here's, here's where it is. The spirit of God, as he convicts us, is always in a way of kindness and grace. It's not in a fire and brimstone way. There might be occasions to that, but it's scripture that tells us it's his kindness that leads us to repentance. I'm thankful that the Holy Spirit is kind and he's not fearing you into a relationship. Listen, if you were saved in the era where it's just like, you better get right or you're gonna burn, turn or burn, you know? God's grace, he loves you. He loves you. His mercy and his grace is so big for you. And he understands the weakness of the flesh because he himself put on flesh. He understands temptations. He understands where you're coming from. He's not looking for perfection. And so I just want you all, us all, to lean into the conviction of the Holy Spirit. It's his kindness. It's his grace. It's always clothed in grace so that we might live a holy life. He convicts us. He doesn't just convict us, but he brings power. And Acts chapter 1, 8 says, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, okay? Living a spirit-filled life will bring you a newfound power. In what way? Well, let's continue to read. But you will be, uh, you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses. You will be my what? Witnesses in Jerusalem in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. So he gives us the power to witness. God will give you the courage. 
He will give you the boldness. He will give you the words. I ask you, church, 930, I look out and I see a lot of people that have brought friends. And maybe you're sitting beside someone uh, that invited you to church and that's how you came to know the Lord. But I challenge some of us, all of us, when was the last time that it was you that opened up your words and you began to preach the gospel and you began to testify of God's faithfulness and his mercy and his love? I love that people bring people to church and I love that you invite your friends and your coworkers and your family members to church, but that's just passing the baton to us. Holy Spirit will give you a newfound power to be a witness to those that you have direct influence. I believe there are people in my life that are saved, that I have led to the Lord, but they don't attend our church. And I, 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 that might be hard for some people to understand, like, what, you can be a Christian and not go to church? Well, it's hard to be a Christian and not go to church. It, it might not last real long. You know, you need to be around that. It's, it's meant Jesus established a church. But I'm, I'm thankful that, that God can flow through each and every one of you. If God can talk through a donkey to Balaam, oh Lord, he can talk through you and me, right? Man, God will give you a courage. But how many know that in our witness, it's not just our talk, but it's our actions? So one of the other things that Holy Spirit does is he gives us power to overcome sin, to overcome sin. Galatians 5, 16 and 17 says, but I say, walk by the spirit and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. For the desire of the flesh is against the spirit and the spirit is against the flesh. For these are in opposition to one another in order to keep you from doing whatever you want. So it's not saying that the Holy Spirit is against my skin. Like, oh, I just can't stand my skin, right? The flesh is just talking about things that we naturally want that aren't God's way. Lust, greed, envy, rage, and anger, and all these different things. And Paul is saying, your spirit and your flesh are at opposition. Holy Spirit will come in and help you resist the temptation to live in a godly manner and resist the temptations of the flesh. If you want your words to have weight, then your walk better back up your talk. And I honestly believe that one of the main reasons why people don't like to open up their mouth and share about the goodness of God is because there are things that the Spirit of God has convicted you in, yet you're not letting go of, that you're not walking in freedom, that you haven't overcome. And the shame and the guilt and the I know better keeps your mouth shut, keeps our mouths shut, because it's like, well, man, I, I said that swear word earlier today and he probably doesn't think that I'm a Christian. Can I just tell you that there is grace in both areas and God wants you to overcome. There, there might be people here that have held on to sins for years and decades. The spirit of God is the only one that can help you overcome. You can put covenant eyes on your computer. You can have accountability partners. You can do all these different things, but it's the spirit of God that gives you power. It's the spirit of God that actually changes the desire of your heart. I used to preach this in college and I was wrong. I mean, it's right, but it's wrong. I used to say, oh my goodness, I'm running out of time. I used to say, sin equals opportunity plus desire. And if you're like a math person, all you have to do is remove a part of the equation to not get sin. So I'm like, well, just remove the opportunity and you won't sin, right? The problem is Satan will always bring more opportunity and more opportunity and more opportunity. So it's a temporal change to overcome temptation is, is removing the opportunity. Don't, don't go to the bar. Don't hang out with these people. Don't do things. But the permanent change is the work of the Holy Spirit where it says desire. So desire plus opportunity equals sin. We need the permanent change where our desire is completely changed supernaturally by the Holy Spirit of God. He's the one who comes in and says, man, Austin, you are a new creation. There is now no condemnation for those who are found in Christ. Your mind is made new and transformed by the Spirit of God. I gotta keep on going. There are so many other things that I wanna talk about. I'm just gonna talk about one more, freedom. I don't think it's on the screen, but freedom. 2 Corinthians 3.17 says, now the Lord is the spirit and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. 
There is freedom. The Bible describes living in sin like living in chains. You know that sin in the moment, it feels really, really sweet, but how many know it that just gives you a gut rot after? Yesterday, um, our kids usually are up about seven o'clock, right at seven. Yesterday, they all slept till eight. I happened to wake up with no alarm at about 6.15, 6.20. I was like, you've got to be kidding me. So I'm just reviewing my sermon. I was doing some research on some food plot stuff for hunting and, you know, just whatever. And so I hear the kids get up at eight. Normally they come in on the weekends and they, they'll jump in bed and they'll cuddle with us for a little bit and we just cherish that time together. But they didn't. They went downstairs. I heard another kid get up and then eventually all three kids are up downstairs playing peacefully in the basement by themselves. And I wake Elizabeth up and, and uh, we're sitting there and we're just kind of talking and just enjoying the moment. And I'm thinking, God, is this heaven? Is this... Is this uh, is this what's to come like in the next few years when our kids become independent and we're like, we should probably get up. Like they're usually eating breakfast at 7.15, 7.20 and it's like nine, nine ten now. Elizabeth goes downstairs. She comes back up carrying our youngest, Essie. And I just start to laugh. I see chocolate all around her face. I see a jelly bean stuck to her chin. <laughs> We go downstairs and there's 21 wrappers of candy. Now, it wasn't just Essie. All three of our um, perfect children were, <laughs> were culprits, right? And so we had this wonderful illustration. Elizabeth is an amazing mom and she takes out these building blocks and she begins to build it and she talks about building trust. And she says, now, but when you do things, you can pull that trust and what happens? And it falls down and I'm just like, you're amazing. I would have just been like, get over here and bend over, you know, like she's, she's, she's awesome. Hey, um, I gotta be careful saying that online. Someone's going to turn me in or something. Um, but you know, we have this conversation about trust and you could just see the guilt in all three of our kids and they, and we weren't being mean. We weren't yelling at them. We weren't, we we're just teaching them a lesson of a, a relatively small consequence. Well, 20, 30 minutes later, Essie's like, my tummy hurts, mommy and daddy. My, my stomach hurts. And we're like, well, yeah, you ate a whole lot of sugar before eating any other protein or anything else. And I feel like sin is kind of the same way where it seems really sweet, but the end, it just leaves you feeling rotten. And I think there are a lot of people who live in bondage to that cycle of just feeling like there's got to be more. This is so miserable. And then you go out and you try the same thing with a different person in a different environment, hoping for a different result. And, and you're living in chains to sin. There is freedom found through the Holy Spirit as he sets you free. There's freedom in Christ. There's no guilt or shame or condemnation for those who are in Christ. Freedom is yours as you allow the Holy Spirit to fill you. There's so many wonderful things that Holy Spirit offers us, and I don't have time to talk about the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians 5 or the nine spiritual gifts found in 1 Corinthians 12. But the main thing I want you to remember if you're taking notes is this. To live like Christ is to live a life that is Spirit-filled. To live like Christ is to live a Spirit-filled life. Last scripture we'll look at is found in Luke chapter four, verses one and two, where it talks about Jesus launching into his ministry. It says, Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, left the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. So you see, before Jesus does any ministry on earth, the first thing that he does, he spends 40 days and nights and he's fasting and he's praying and he's being spirit-filled. He's full of the Spirit, led by the Spirit. And then we see the perfect demonstration of Christ living out a Spirit-filled life. What do we see as he walks and he interacts with Jews and Gentiles and males and females and freed and slaves and all these different people that he interacts? He's, Jesus brought truth to the people. He was bold with his words, yet he lived a holy life. He was the perfect demonstration of love and joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. Jesus lived a spirit-filled life. And hear me this morning, 
if you want to live like Jesus, if you want to be a Christ follower and have your life look like Jesus, the only way that we can do that is to live a spirit-filled life and to be open to the person of Holy Spirit filling us. In just a minute, People are gonna stand, we're gonna sing a song, and I'm just gonna invite people that would be open to God filling them in a greater capacity to come to the altar. This is not a service where we're gonna be praying for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Nobody's gonna come up and put their hand on you and push at you or pull out their prayer hanky and you know do any weird stuff. And It's just saying, God, I'm open to all that you have for me. And so that's gonna come in just a minute. Musicians, would you come? I believe that one of the greatest ways to have influence in people's uh, life is through relationship. If you've heard me preach before, you've probably heard me talk about my two biggest hobbies, which is hunting and mountain biking. I absolutely love mountain biking. It was about four years ago um, that I took my first trip to Northwest Arkansas, which is dubbed the mountain bike capital of the world. Yes, it's true. And I became absolutely obsessed with it, the feeling and everything. And, and it was just incredible. And so I, I started like asking anybody and everybody to go mountain biking. I think I've added it up in the last four years that I've been into the sport. I think I've caused six people to buy mountain bikes that didn't previously have mountain bikes. Call me a good influence, call me a bad influence. I don't know, but I'm bringing people into the sport. And I remember uh, asking Pastor Zach and Pastor Luke, almost daily, you can ask them, almost daily, I said, when are you gonna go to Bentonville with me? When, when are you gonna go biking with me? When are you gonna go biking with me? Zach is still lame, he's never gone with me. But Pastor Luke, eventually, after a year plus of me asking him to go mountain biking, he said, okay, I'll go mountain biking with you. And guess who owns a full suspension bike with all the gear and the helmet and everything else? Pastor Luke does. Pastor Luke does. See, Pastor Luke didn't shut out a relationship with me while I kept on asking him about going mountain biking with me. But how many know that as you spend time with someone, they begin to rub off on you? The likes, your hobbies, your interests, all of these different things, the way that you speak, you begin to rub off on that person. That's probably why Pastor Luke is such a great preacher today is, you know, we spend a lot of time just teasing. I believe having a relationship with Holy Spirit is similar. As you spend time together, he will rub off on you in these ways. The fruit of the Spirit, the love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control, all of these things, they'll begin to be a part of who you are. As you spend time with the person, Holy Spirit, you begin to see people the way that God wants you to see them and the way that he sees them. You will begin to find this newfound power to be a witness, to live out your faith in a way. Some of you might be like, I'm cool with a lot of what you said today, but I'm just not sure that I'm ready to speak in tongues. I'm not sure that I'm just ready to like start interpreting things, you know. I'm I'm not sure I'm ready for that. Can I just speak to that for just a minute this morning? God sees that and he knows that and he's okay with that. Please hear me, don't forsake having a relationship with Holy Spirit because you're not ready to go mountain biking. Don't forsake having a relationship with the Holy Spirit because you're not ready for speaking in tongues or one aspect of who he is. Holy Spirit is so much more than just the baptism of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is all of these things that we just talked about. And as you spend time with him, Things will just begin to happen. Who doesn't want truth? Who doesn't need wisdom? Who who doesn't need help and strength and, and the power to overcome? Holy Spirit is so good to us. And it's my prayer and it's my heart that we all as a church would be open to everything that he has for us. Would you stand with me? God is so good. He's so faithful. Here's a wonderful thing. I know I just talked with someone uh, on the way out of the first service. He said, I received the baptism of the Holy Spirit with several hundred, and I thought he was going to be people. He said, hogs. I was a hog farmer. And the Lord just met me out in that barn one day. I know that there's a professor at North Central. He was chopping onions. 
He said, I wasn't sure if I was crying or if it was the onions, but I just began to... The Spirit of God is everywhere and He lives inside of you. And this is my challenge, it's a practical challenge wherever you're at. Would you this week, as you wake up, as you get ready, would you just simply say, Holy Spirit, would you fill my heart and would you fill my mind today? I'm open to whatever you want for me. And just say, I'm open to the Spirit of God and ask God to fill you. Because we just read in scripture, Jesus' own words, if a son asks for an egg, is his father gonna give him a scorpion? If a son asks for a fish, is he gonna give him a snake? No, how much more is the Father in heaven willing to give the Spirit to those who ask?